And we have got a huge team to start us off. Joining me now, NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is in Jerusalem. NBC's Courtney Cuby is at the Pentagon. NBC's Monica Alba is outside the White House. And I'm also joined by retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, former Deputy Commander of U.S. European Command and an NBC News military analyst. Aaron, I have to start with you in the region. Talk about how successful uh, Israel was at defending itself in this instance. And does Israel believe that this is the extent of Iran's retaliation or are they bracing for more? Well, Kristen, at this point, Iran says the attack is over unless Israel decides to retaliate. We just heard there from the NSA's uh, Jake Sullivan say that the attack was, quote, defeated and ineffective. We also just heard from an Israeli military spokesperson say that more than 180 missiles were fired from Iran toward Israel. A majority of those missiles were intercepted by Israel, as well as a defensive coalition that this spokesperson said was led by the United States. Unclear at this point if other countries were involved. Uh, this military spokesperson said that there was limited damage done in central Israel as a result of the missiles that somehow made it through that defense system. Uh, and also there were impacts in southern Israel. In terms of casualties, we are hearing that two people were lightly wounded as a result of uh, this missile strike, that according to Israeli medics, uh, Israeli officials are calling this a significant uh, escalation. Kristen. And Aaron, of course, the question becomes what happens next? Based on your conversations with your sources, has Israel signaled one way or another whether it intends to respond with a direct attack? Well, it, it, the Israeli military spokespeople are saying that there will be a response. The question, of course, will be how will that response be calibrated? A number of factors will play into that. And sort of to give you a, a, a sense of perspective here, the last time that Iran launched a, a barrage of missiles on Israel was back in April. At the time, Iran launched an estimated, according to Israeli military sources, 110 to 120 missiles, this time 180 ballistic missiles. So this is a significant escalation. That will be a factor in Israel's response. Also will be a factor the fact that uh, there were only two people, according to Israeli medics, lightly wounded. The damage done, uh, Israeli military spokesperson saying that a, a school was hit in central Israel as a result of the attack. So all of that will go into how Israel will calibrate their response. But I do think it is worth pointing out how, according to the Israeli military, the U.S. was the lead in that defensive coalition. Mm. And what the U.S. wants will also be a very significant factor in terms of calibrating that response. And what we know the U.S. has been uh, adamant about throughout this entire fraught time period is a de-escalation. Mm -hmm. uh, the U United States very much wants to avoid that, that regional war. And we heard President Biden just over the weekend, Aaron, in fact, say that what he wants to see is a ceasefire agreement. Aaron, underscoring the fact that the tensions continue to escalate in the region. There were also reports of gunfire in Tel Aviv. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's right. That was an attack that happened just before this missile strike, just before 7.30 local time, according to uh, the Israeli police. Two gunmen opened fire in Jaffa, which is near Tel Aviv. They were apparently on a local train. They got off the train, and then uh, one of the gunmen began indiscriminately firing, killing six and wounding nine uh, both of the gunmen have been shot and killed by Israeli uh, police. That, according to Israeli uh, officials, medics were on the scene. It was really a really chilling scene there uh, in Jaffa tonight. Mm. Aaron McLaughlin, thank you so much for your fantastic reporting from the region. Please continue to stay safe, my friend. We really appreciate it. Courtney Cuby, let me turn to you. You and I have been tracking, working our sources throughout the weekend into 
this week as the region really braced for a potential counterattack by Iran retaliation in the wake of Israel, of course, taking out the leader of Hezbollah. What are your sources telling you about what might happen next, Court? It, 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 everything is on the table, frankly, at this point. I mean, I mean, candidly, there is a widespread belief that Israel will respond in some way, but it's really not clear at this point uh, what they may do. Now, I, I, I will say, we keep getting directed back to what happened in April. And I will say, so far, that guidance has been pretty accurate. In April, Iran launched over 300 projectiles. The vast majority of them were shot down. Israel was, responded quickly with a pretty targeted in, uh, strike inside Iran that more than anything else was really sent to send, uh, intended to send a message to Iran that Israel has the ability to strike well inside the country and to really hold their nuclear facilities at risk here. The question is, today's attack, where it is similar to April's, mm -hmm. is that it was, a, it was hundreds of projectiles, but it was a little bit different in scale, mm -hmm. in that even though there were fewer total projectiles, ballistic missiles simply have a, a different message and a different impact than some of the projectiles and even the loitering munitions that Iran launched back in April. What I mean is these are precise uh, weapons. They are they move frankly much faster at a ballistic trajectory and, and uh, than than something like a smaller drone. Uh, and they have the potential to have a much bigger payload and have a much bigger impact on the ground. They're also difficult to intercept. You know, I mean after years of conflict, I I I, I think people may lose sight of just how difficult it is to intercept a ballistic missile. We're literally talking about essentially hitting a bullet with a bullet here to take these things down. So when you look at what happened today, upwards of 200 of these ballistic missiles, it seems that the vast majority of them were actually intercepted by various systems. It is quite a feat. Um, but all that being said, the fact that there were they were all so far that we know of ballistic missiles used in this attack today, it does escalate it, mm. or it is more serious than we saw in April, even though the total number of projectiles was actually less. So, all that is that that it stands to reason that Israel would respond in some way. We've been asking officials if U.S. officials and others may be urging them not to. You'll remember in April, President Biden saying to to uh, Bibi Netanyahu, "Take the win." after they knocked down the vast majority of the, the projectiles fired then. We haven't heard that same kind of language yet at this point yet, Kristen. It's such an important point and reminder there, Courtney. And just to be really clear, I mean, it's so fascinating to hear you talk about the differences between this attack and the attack in April. And as you mentioned, the U.S. really did help to intercept a number of those missiles that were fired back in April. What role did the Pentagon play in this attack, Court? So it seems for now it was a smaller role in the total number of projectiles or missiles that the U.S. was involved in here. We know that they fired at least 12 interceptors. But, Kristen, it's not even clear if all of those interceptors actually struck an incoming missile or not. Uh, the, the Pentagon says they're still assessing that and trying to figure it out. So it does seem like the U.S., from a purely defensive position or, or role, was slightly smaller than it was back in April. What we don't know is whether the U.S. was involved in helping the uh, Israelis detect the missiles when they were launched. So remember, the U.S. military has a series of ground-based and sea-based radars throughout the region. They have the ability to detect a ballistic missile when it fires within seconds, to help with trajectory, with where it could land. We don't yet know if the U.S. was able to share that information with the Israelis. Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon, thank you so much. We really appreciate all your great information. As always, Monica, let me go to you outside of the White House. You've obviously been all over this story since early this morning. Talking to your sources, take us behind the scenes as this was all unfolding. What was happening at the White House while these uh, missiles were being launched? Well, we know, Kristen, that since early this morning, President Biden, Vice President Harris, and their top national security officials were huddled, were convening, were trying to figure out, based on these indications, when this attack was going to take place. And then there were a series of Situation Room meetings, and they were monitoring, as you see there, the events in real time. And I can tell you that we just heard from President Biden on this for the first time on camera since this has happened today. He was in a spray related to the devastation from Hurricane Helene, and he was asked by reporters, and he echoed some of the things we heard from National Security Advisor 
Sullivan, but he did talk about specifically how this attack was ineffective. It was defeated by Israel's own air defense capabilities and systems with an assist from the U.S. And the president underscored something that we've heard him say dozens of times in the last year or so, which is that the U.S., and I quote, he said, is fully, fully, fully supportive of Israel. So expect that to be something that the administration continues to talk about. But at the same time, they are teasing that there will be some kind of a response to Israel that's appropriate, that will have some consequences, and that that's something that the U.S. and Israel will be discussing, and that there could be some kind of larger conversation about what that looks mm -hmm. like. Now, when that takes place, that's an open question, as you've been discussing, mm -hmm. but the president all day long behind the scenes here was monitoring this. We know that key security officials were speaking to their counterparts, for instance, the Secretary of Defense and others, certainly, as this was ongoing. And this is a case where really, right now, the U.S. is saying they're very encouraged by the fact that there don't appear to be any Israeli deaths connected specifically to the barrage of missile attacks. But they're also stressing that the fog of war in these moments means that things are fluid and things can still change. But the president's top priority in all of this, Kristen, as you know, has been to try to tamp down the temperature to be sure that there isn't a wider war. And it's this kind of backwards thinking, you could say a little bit, that something like what we saw today could imply that that will be the case, that you sort of escalate to then de-escalate. Now, whether that is a reality, that's still mm -hmm. very, very fluid. But that's certainly what the White House has been talking about and hoping for. But it's unclear yeah. now in terms of the response in the region, yeah. what that means and how that could escalate. Monica, thank you so much for your great reporting. And we are going to play that sound you just alluded to from President Biden. Here's the president. Some words about Iran's missile attack on Israel today. At my direction, the United States military actively supported the defense of Israel, and we're still assessing the impact. But based on what we know now, the attack appears to have been defeated and ineffective. And this is testament to Israeli military capability and U.S. military. I'm also, it's also a testament to intensive planning between the United States and Israel to anticipate and defend against the brazen attack we expected. Make no mistake, the United States is fully, fully, fully supportive of Israel. And I just got been spent the morning in the, and part of the afternoon in the Situation Room and uh, meeting with my whole national security team and consulting with the Israelis indirectly because, I mean, in terms of their impact on us. And the national security team has been, as I said, in constant contact with Israeli officials and their counterparts and is and this going to continue to be brought to me throughout the day. We still have to share updates uh, and uh, when we get them, and we will do that. And uh, now I want to turn to what we're going to be talking about today, the uh, damage done by this, this horrible hurricane. My top priority, and I mean this sincerely because we've been through a lot of these, my top priority is to ensure the communities devastated by this hurricane get the help and support they need as quickly as possible as quickly as possible. As we watch the storm from the Gulf region form. And we were just listening to President Biden for the first time speak on camera and address the Iran missile attack on Israel, making it very clear that the United States stands firmly with Israel, that the U.S. is still assessing the situation. I want to go out to Lieutenant General Steph Twitty. Uh, Lieutenant General, I'd like your reaction to what you just heard from President Biden, also what you're anticipating in terms of a response from Israel. Yeah, good to be with you this afternoon. What I'll tell you about the response uh, with Israel, I don't think it's a question about if uh, Israel will respond, it's about when. If you can imagine, think about 200 ballistic missiles being attacked or shot at the United States, would we defend the country and would we also attack the country that did that to us? And so Israel views Iran as an existential threat, and I think they will retaliate, and I think they have an opportunity to weaken Iran just like they're weak in Hezbollah, they're weak in Hamas. I also think they'll go after the I IRGC in Syria and Iraq, and we could uh, anticipate them going after the nuclear capability in Iran. Mm. So that's sort of how I see things uh, as we go through the evening. 
Is there at this point, because we heard President Biden over the weekend say that what he wants to see ultimately is a de-escalation of these tensions, and he wants to see a, at least a temporary ceasefire. Is there any off-ramp at this point? How do these tensions begin to start to simmer down if what we are seeing yeah. are these continued escalations, Lieutenant General? Yeah, this is, as you know, this is multi-complex. Uh, you first have to stop, start with October the 7th. And you know that's still simmering, and Hamas is still simmering, and the Israelis are still fighting in Gaza, although the tension is now on Hezbollah and Iran. And then we have the issue with the Houthis, who are in solidarity with Hamas in Gaza. And then we have Hezbollah in the north. They continue to fire missiles into northern uh, Israel, displacing 60,000 or so Israelis. And then we have the uh, Iran, the big daddy of them all that's controlling things. And so in order to tamper this down, it, it starts with Iran. And that's where I see the, the Arab communities coming in to try and help out in this situation. Folks like Qatar, Jordan, Saudis stepping up to, to help out here. But uh, until we get the, the situation in Gaza under control, I think we'll continue to see these type of actions, the simmering and boiling over actions, both in, if from Israel, Iran, and proxies. All right, Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, thank you so much for bringing us your expertise and your insights today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.